All right, take your Bibles now and let's stand for the reading of God's Word. All right, if you don't have your Bible, use your smartphone as a last resort until you can get one. Galatians chapter number 4. I want to read verse number 29 of chapter 3 to show you how Paul is segueing into this new what we typically call pericope or section of Scripture. Verse number 29, and if you are Christ, if you, if you are Christ, everyone in this room is not Christ. The fact that you have a pulse does not mean you are Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. You're not a biological descendant of Abraham, you are a spiritual descendant of Abraham through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And since you are therefore a descendant of Abraham, offspring, you are heirs. You are heirs according to promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he's a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything. But he's under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, so Paul's now going to draw a parallel. In the same way, we we also, referring to those in verse number 29, if you are Christ, plural pronoun there, if we, in the same way, we also, when we were children were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But, but when the fullness of time had come, God, God sent forth His Son. He sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, for this purpose. So we could read the text. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son to redeem those who were under the law. Why? Why did he do that? Why did he send his son into the world to redeem those that are under the law? He answers the question, in order or so that we might receive Adoption as sons. So through Christ Jesus, God is making it possible for each and every human being to become a son or daughter or child of God. All right? So now you're going to move from being a slave to a son. And then he's going to continue. Verse 6. And because... or Since this has happened, and because you are sons, because you've been adopted into the family of God, God is going to do another thing. He's going to send His Spirit, the Spirit of His Son, into your heart. Once the Spirit gets inside your heart, you're going to cry, Abba, Father. Now that Abba Father is is just kind of like a tiny abbreviated way of communicating that who you love is going to utterly change. So, so now now you went from a slave to an adopted son indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And the spirit inside you is now crying out to your adopted father, Abba, I love you. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you're a son, then you're now an heir. You're an heir through God. Let's pray. 
come into our assembly, Holy Spirit, in a uber powerful way. And help me, Lord, to get utterly out of the way and let the proclamation of your word, this, this glorious proclamation of truth, help me, oh God, to, to see it and to be able to communicate it in all its glory. Help us, oh God, to be good listeners. In Jesus' name, amen. So this idea of an heir may not be something that we're super familiar with, but it would have been utterly familiar with everyone alive at the time of Paul's writing. An heir is someone who inherits, who has now a right to something that they didn't work for, and it suddenly becomes theirs. They are an heir. So Paul says, I mean that an heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he's the owner of everything. He's under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So Paul is using something that would have been very familiar to each and every one reading it in the days of the Roman Greco world there, in which those who have means, those who are wealthy, will employ guardians, managers, tutors, schoolmasters to get their kids from infancy to the day and age when they're able to become the heir, when they're able to inherit what God or the master in that case has for them. They may take over the family business. They may assume a position of leadership. And so Paul is saying, using something you're real familiar with, that is to say that you will hire guardians, managers to get this baby to adulthood on that day set by the father in which you'll no longer be considered a child you're now the son. You're now the heir. So he takes something that they're familiar with and he grabs that for himself. And he says, your entire Old Testament is like that. Your entire Old Testament is like that. Instead of saying, as long as he is a child, think of it like all of Israel. All of Israel. That God was keeping all of Israel preserved through guardians and managers until when? Until the date that God had set to send his son, Jesus, who's going to change everything. So Israel is, is all but a slave through all the Old Testament, working its way to that decisive day and time that God knew where he's going to send his son into the earth so that all those children could be adopted into the family of God and be declared heirs. So first Paul uses it in the sense of a, a child in your home. Then I'm applying it in a corporate sense to all of Israel. And then third, it's each and every one here. Each and every one of us individually. That we too were, and I don't mean like when you were a baby, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about before you came to Christ. Before you came to Christ. Uh, in the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Now, we need to grab a hold of this. We've got to get this. We wonder to ourselves... Why aren't children coming to Christ? Why aren't teenagers repenting and believing the gospel? Why is it that someone will sit in this auditorium for weeks and weeks and weeks under the proclamation of the gospel and not come to Christ? Why aren't they beating down the door saying, I need to be baptized and get me in the water. I need to make a public profession of my faith in Christ. I trusted Jesus three weeks ago and I need to show the world. Why isn't that happening Paul says the answer is they're enslaved. They're enslaved. They're enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. All right, what is the most elementary principle of the world? What's the, what's the most elementary? If we could break it down to the most elementary principle of the world, it's this. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. And you live your entire life for who? Who do you live your entire life for? 
yourself. Come on. How many of you remember that day when you took your son or daughter, your grandchild, and you said to them, today I'm going to teach you a very important lesson. I'm going to teach you how to be selfish. Do you remember when you had that talk with them? This is not natural for you. You are normally a generous, willing participant in all of humanity, and you need to become selfish. And, and this is an important component to human life, is being immensely selfish and self-centered. So I'm going to give you some time to learn this well, and if you don't become super selfish, I'm going to start disciplining you. You don't remember that? No. Yeah, I know right. You know why? Because they're enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Whether that be the basics of Judaism, the basic of Judaism, which is I do my best to keep the law and hope that God judges me as good over bad. Whether that be pagan idolatry, whether that be eat, sleep, and drink for tomorrow we may die. Paul is teaching us this morning that each and every human being that has ever been born post Adam and Eve, because they are the only two that weren't born with the sin nature, after that, everyone born and enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. This is why on a Sunday morning, the preacher who's proclaiming the good news of salvation through Christ Jesus is competing with Snapchat. Right. Likes on the phone. Competing with it. It can't even get it down. I walk around the auditorium. Now we're even kind of being discreet about it. You know, last week and before we were just right there in the face. Now it's kind of like this. So maybe the preacher won't notice that I'm still glued to my cell phone. Glued to the elementary principles of this world. Glued to that which satisfies me. That which I enjoy the most. Paul is reminding each and every one of us of our condition prior to being saved. We are blinded. We're enslaved. We are spiritually dead. Completely alienated from God. And we don't get this. This is one of the real struggles with second generation Christianity. When you grow up in church, when you grow up in Christian education, when you are saturated with it Monday to Friday in Christian school, Wednesday night is Awana or Bible club or youth group, Sunday twice or three times a day, you don't feel alienated from God. Right. You're so immense into it that you don't even realize the reality is you're still enslaved. You haven't been set free. You haven't been delivered. This is the utter challenge to the second and third generations. Since the physical reality is we are not blind, enslaved, or dead, it doesn't seem like a big deal to be redeemed, delivered, or rescued. They don't feel as though tomorrow you may die. They don't feel as tomorrow you may find yourself in hell, separated from a holy and righteous God. Because they are immersed into a Christian home. Somebody prays. Somebody carries the Bible. Mama loves Jesus. That's got to be good enough for me. So what Paul is now doing is he's comparing and contrasting our former state to now. So... God kept the people of God, the Israelites, under managers and guardians until the date that he set to deliver Jesus, the Messiah, into human history. How do you know that's the case? Because of verse 4. But when, but when the fullness of time had come. So, so God has been orchestrating from Adam and Eve all these things with a predetermined objective in mind. I'm going to create humanity. They're going to fall into sin. I'm going to redeem them through Jesus Christ. So for 6,000 years or 5,000 years of 
human history, God has been keeping the people of God through guardians and managers until the decisive day in which he sends Jesus into human history. But when the fullness of time, not, not the half, but the full, everything was done, from our human perspective, there are at least three major things that we can see. Number one, there was an incredible peace in Rome, an incredible peace in Rome. It was an ideal time for Jesus to come. This was the time in which gospel proclamation could go unhindered without war interfering. Number one, there was a peace of Rome. Number two, Koine Greek was a great language to communicate gospel truth in. It had become the equivalent of English in today's world. It was excellent. Most people read it and understood it. And it was a good time to give us a New Testament in this language of Greek. Number three, because of the power and the wealth and the desire of the Roman Empire to be able to move troops anywhere they wanted to put down resistance, they developed a great interstate, the equivalent of America's interstates. You could travel where you needed to go. And these missionaries, these church planters, would use these great roads that Rome had created for gospel proclamation. So I'm not for a moment suggesting that I know all the fullness of time had come, but those are things that are obvious to me that God used in the preparation of the gospel proclamation that would happen by the apostles. And then we read this word right here, sent. This amazing, deliberate action by God. And I've used this illustration, and I'll use it one more time, and I'll use it again and again to somehow communicate to a church. Me, us, all of us. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not condescending for a moment. All of us in this room do not fully grasp what God did for us in Christ. All of us. We live comfortable, affluent lives. With great freedom. If we're honest, if we're all just like, our lives are good. Like the greatest crisis we have right now is that some of our families and friends have deployed overseas. And it's rocking our little world a little bit. Am I wrong or right? We love our lives. And so when we read in verse number four, God sent forth his son, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't understand that we were enslaved. We don't understand that we were trapped. We don't understand that we were in bondage. We don't grasp the idea that one day we were at the mall and we were just shopping and it was a normal day at the mall until that truck pulled up and that door flipped open and two people threw us in the back of this van and the door slid shut and they drove off. We don't understand that we're being held right now in the basement of an abandoned building, that we're currently blindfolded, that we're currently cuffed behind our hands in zip ties. We don't understand the fact that somebody wants a ransom to free us. We don't understand the fact that there's no hope for anyone rescuing us. We are begging God to send someone. Are you getting it a little bit? Are you getting it a little bit? It's been days. It's been weeks. We're at the point, Chris, where we've abandoned hope. We are lost it. We're thinking to ourselves, we're going to die in captivity. Until God sent. God sent. Come on, we love this story on the movies. 
We love this story when someone can write it well and play it up good. And then the president of the United States issues the order, go get them. Execute plan B. Send in America's best. Send the door kickers in. They've been rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing. And now they're ready to go get you. I need you to understand, this is what Paul is communicating. God sent forth the door kickers. To what end? To rescue you. Enslaved, in bondage, needing to be delivered. This is divine intentionality. This is the Father's master plan. This is why Paul says to us that we need our eyes open. Remember uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world is blind in the eyes that believe not. We need our eyes open to this master glorious plan. We can take a step back and see the handiwork of God working all things out to get us to this decisive moment. All right, let's, let's stay with our little illustration. We are in captivity, and we are being held, and we are like this, and our feet are tied up, and our hands are behind here, and once a day we get released to urinate, and every now and then some water's through in our mouth to keep us from dying, and every now and then a piece of bread is given to us so that we can live. Because I'm valuable as a hostage. Everyone got it? Yes, you got it. Are you here this morning? And we're wondering to ourselves, when are they going to come rescue us? When are they going to come? And Paul says, in the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, they had to rehearse. A model had to be built. Recon had to happen, Chuck. We can't just send them in blindly. Get it? And this is God working all this out. This is the master plan for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates, but God commended, but God showed his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is Stephen preaching about God sending Moses. And suddenly we realize that Moses is just a type of Christ. He's a guardian. He's a manager. God used Moses as a guardian to get Israel out for a period of time. Why? To preserve a people unto himself so that at the decisive date when he sent Jesus, there would be a people ready. So in the New Testament, God sent Jesus, his one and only son, to the world. Born of a woman. Born under the law. Mary, Joseph, all human, circumcised on the eighth day, perfectly obedient unto the Mosaic law so that he could do what we couldn't do. And then we get to this word right here, redeem. In church, we really don't get it. We really don't get redeemed. We don't understand it. We just got to let in one ear and out the other. We would understand it if we were in bondage. But since we don't see ourselves in bondage, we don't understand it. Here's some definitions. To free from what distresses or harms. To free from captivity by payment of a ransom. To extricate from something detrimental. Like this. When is somebody going to come rescue me? I am an American citizen. Come on, think about what you'd be thinking about. There is a government out there. We are part of, America is the superpower. How can I be a U.S. citizen and in a foreign land right now being held as a prisoner of war and nobody's going to come get me? What would be going through your mind? Would it not be racing? Or how about this one? How about this one? This is a picture of you inside your SUV, your upside down sedan right here. 
And you know what you need? You need someone to extricate you. You can't get yourself out. You know what you need? You need someone to send the fire department. You need someone to send the well-trained people. You are going to die inside that vehicle if somebody doesn't send someone. The only way that you and I fully grasp what God has done for us in Christ Jesus is to understand where we were before Jesus. And because we don't understand where we are before Jesus, we don't care much about Jesus. This is why I'm talking about second generation Christianity. Whole row of people that are just barely paying attention. Just barely holding on. They're not receiving Christ. They're not trusting in Jesus. They're not coming up to us and saying, when are you going to baptize me? Because I put my faith in Jesus three weeks ago, and it's high time I start showing the world that I love Jesus. Gee, the church got backwards. We come begging on you. Would you please get baptized? Our baptism numbers aren't looking very good for the convention. We need to report better baptism numbers. Baptize them at four years old. Baptism was never intended to be for four-year-olds. Baptism was a public proclamation of faith in Jesus Christ. And when people got rescued, they couldn't wait to tell the world that they'd been rescued. I promise you, if that's you, and the Fayetteville Fire Department does something like that for you, you won't ever bore of telling them about the day you were upside down in an SUV, and they cut you out with the jaws of life. Am I wrong? The issue is, we see ourselves as pretty good people. And we really can't imagine how God would send us to hell. Do you know that my mommy teaches Sunday school? Do you know that my daddy serves on the school board? I mean, there's no way that he would send anyone who's on the school board to hell. Come on. We don't see ourselves as upside down in an SUV flipped upside down in a sedan. We don't see ourselves in need of being rescued. We don't see ourselves as being handcuffed and blinded and in hostage. We don't think there's a need for ransom. But the Bible teaches that God came to give his life as a ransom. As a ransom. The story of the Bible is one of creation, man falling, God redeeming, and restoring all things as they were before sin. And what we see in this passage is God doing those very things. He moves us from being that slave to that son, and because we are sons, he makes us an heir so that we can inherit a new heaven and a new earth. And here's the reality. Just like Israel fell, like Adam and Eve fell, they fell at their golden calf. Every one of us in this room have a golden calf moment. All of us in this room have been created, and all of us in this room fall. You say, I'm not enslaved. I don't agree with you. All right, let's try this. How about you commit to the tomorrow starting at 6 a.m., that you'll go 12 hours without sinning. Tomorrow morning, starting at 6 a.m., you'll wake up at 6 a.m., and for the next 12 hours, you will not violate God's moral line in even a moment. Now remember, you can never be unthankful. You can never have a moment in those 12 hours of being selfish. You cannot even think a thought that is sinful. You cannot look at a hot girl and think anything inappropriate. Try it tomorrow. Try it. All of you that don't see yourself enslaved to sin, try it tomorrow. See how many minutes you can go without sinning tomorrow. See if you can go an hour without sinning. No sin whatsoever. See if you can push the envelope and go a full 90 minutes without sinning. See how that works out for you. 
See, we don't think we're enslaved. We don't agree with Paul that there's a spiritual enslavement that has occurred. This is why this is not a big deal to us. This is why young people are not running up here saying, what must I do to be saved? Do you remember what we saw about Moses in Acts? He said that God sent him to be a ruler and redeemer. We don't see our need for redemption, and we certainly don't want Jesus ruling over us. Those who are born again have been freed from the power and the penalty of sin. Have you? Have you been freed from the power and the penalty of sin? Notice Paul's point. Born under, of a woman, born under law, in order to redeem us. So how then did Christ redeem us? Paul makes it clear in the previous chapter, he redeemed us by hanging on a tree. He took the curse upon him so that we could be freed from the curse. Let me show you this for just a moment. In Genesis chapter 2, God creates a tree of life in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 3, man falls into sin at a tree. In the New Testament, Christ dies on a tree. He hangs on a tree to redeem man from the fall that took place at a tree. Paul then describes the people of God as being nourished from an olive tree. In fact, being grafted in into a tree. And then Revelation says that God is going to take us back to paradise. And in the middle of paradise, there's going to be a tree. Please listen to me very closely right now. If I told you about an author who wrote a novel that had a tree story like this, you would not think that's a big deal. You would not think that's clever. You might think it's cool that he had a tree narrative that worked its way through the book. You might enjoy that. But what if I told you that it wasn't one author, it was 40 authors? What if I told you that 40 authors who never met, many of them never met, worked a tree narrative from beginning to end? A tree that God created, a tree that man fell at, a tree that God hung at, a tree that represents the people of God, a tree in the paradise. But wait a minute, what if I told you that those 40 authors lived over 1,600 years? What if I told you that it's actually not one book, it's 66 books compiled together? What if I told you that it's not one language, it's actually Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek? So wait a minute, are you telling me, Pastor Sean, that we have a tree narrative that flew from 39 different authors over 1,600 years in three different languages in 66 different books? What are you going to do with that? Ask your Muslim to tell them about your, their 66 books. Ask your Chinese friend who, Confucius or whatever book that they're in love with at the given time, do they have anything close to this? I just gave you an apologetic for the Christian faith. Redeemed reminds us of bought and purchased. These are words that describe the legitimacy and the efficacy of what Christ accomplished. In other words, Christ did not go through the cross to create potential salvation, potential redemption, Potential deliverance, potential justification. In other words, there was no chance that after the cross, God was going to look to Jesus and say, well, that didn't work out very good. Now what are we going to do? I sure hope we'd redeem somebody out of that thing. Nobody took the bait. That's not the story of the New Testament. That's not the story of the New Testament. The story of the New Testament is not that he redeemed the potential to deliver someone. It's that he did, in fact, redeem people. Yes. It wasn't that gee, God was looking down going, I sure hope this works out. Yes. 
turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Should not take you long if you, if you, I hear a lot of pages turning now. It shouldn't be a whole lot. In my Bible, it's one solid page. I want you to see how Paul describes this same story to the church at Ephesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Now just stop right there and realize that Paul has a big picture of God. Paul has a picture of God blessing us in ways more than likes on Facebook. This is blessings in spiritual places, heavenly places. Even as he chose in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless in him, in love, he predestined us for what? Adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Once God opened your eyes, once you're no longer enslaved to the elementary things of this world, once God gives you a set of spiritual glasses, you suddenly see this amazing picture of this big God, this uber big God who's orchestrating all things to a predetermined end. This is God who's predestined. This is God who's adopting. This is God who's working to his glorious plan. In him we have redemption. In him we have redemption through his blood. The ransom wasn't money. The ransom was the blood of God. In him we have redemption. Through his blood we have the forgiveness of our trespasses. This morning I was having a real pity party with myself. I'm in a full-blown pity party. This is where you really feel sorry for yourself. Anyone ever had one of those before? Am I the only one that's had a pity party? And I was asking myself, I don't even know why I'm preaching. You know, Facebook is a curse and a blessing. It is both. It is an utter blessing when you're communicating and you're seeing pictures and it's really cool. And you're like, oh, I went to saw that picture if I hadn't been on there. And then you read about a person who grew up in our academy and church and has utterly walked away from the faith. I mean, a young man that you invested four or five years of your life in. Chapel, Bible, conversations. He had cognitive functions of who Jesus is. Cognitive, cognitive. There's a, there's a difference between cognitive and heart. And, and Leslie's not living at all for Jesus right now. And, and you know, the reality is I shouldn't have read that this morning. It, it was not a good idea. And I thought to myself, what in the world am I even preaching for? Like, I, I mean, I don't even know why I'm going to go preach the gospel this morning. They don't care. You know, if you're ever going to get saved, you're going to have to care. If you don't care about where you spend eternity, I don't have anything for you. If you don't care about what happens to you when I die, I have nothing for you. If you don't give a rip this morning, if you don't care... If there's no concern, if you're not wondering to yourself, when I take the final breath, will I be in front of God? Will I be carried by angels to hell? Will I land somewhere that I don't want to be and be eternally is stuck? You're not climbing your way out of hell. The Bible makes that utterly clear. There's a separation you got to care. Then I remembered, 
I'm not preaching for you. I'm preaching for him. The audience of one. I can't unenslave you. I have no ability to unenslave you. I can't open your eyes. I can't do what only the Spirit of God can do. I can't open your eyes over here. I can't get you to pay attention. I can't get you to be concerned about where you're going to spend eternity. Could you please go back up to the pulpit and stay up there? This is like uber uncomfortable. We sit in the back on purpose. Here's the difference. I care. I care. I care what happens to you when you die. Sometimes I feel like I care more than you care. That I care more than you do. See, you have this idea that you're going to live forever. I mean, young people don't get cancer, right? And they never die in car accidents, right? And they never lose their lives in depression and suicide, right? That never happened. I mean, you're pretty much guaranteed to be 50 years old before you have to deal with Jesus, right? I mean, nobody dies in their 40s. Nobody dies in 30s. I got a text message this morning from Afghanistan. It said, would you please pray for my former company? They had two KIAs and two WIAs. There are young men dying right now. Young women giving their lives. You don't know when you're going to breathe your next last breath. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You could be driving down Yakin Road, Rayford Road, Skybo Road, catastrophic car accident, and the airbags aren't sufficient, and the seatbelt doesn't work sufficiently, and you are dead, dead on arrival. We have this notion that everyone's a child of God. Everyone's a child of God. Everyone's a child of God. I'll be good to go. I'm a good person. You know what that is? That is the elementary principles of this world. And Paul said we are enslaved to the elementary principles of this world. Turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. This will be the last section of scripture we talk about this morning. I need you to see this. 1 John chapter 3. Verse number one, see. Isn't that an interesting language, see? The God of this world has blinded the minds of those that believe not so that they cannot what? See. They can't see. This is why young people are running up after the service and saying, what do I need to do to be saved? You know why? Because they can't see. That's why we need to pray more. We need to pray that God would open their eyes to see the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, see. What can I see? See what kind of love the Father has given to us. Every single time there's a door kicking team that's sent somewhere to rescue somebody, it is a demonstration of love for humanity. Think about what I'm saying to you. These guys that do this for a living risk their lives to rescue someone they've never met before. Think about that. Where does that come from? It doesn't come from a Darwinian evolutionary perspective of survival from the fittest. 
Where then does that come from that we have men and women who are willing to put on Kevlar and put themselves in harm's way to rescue someone they've never seen before and may never see again? I'll tell you where it comes from. They are made in the image of God and they are image bearers of a God who loves humanity. And that God created that love for humanity in their hearts. You don't have a better explanation. Right. Nothing you can come up with, psychologists or sociologists, that has a better explanation. Darwin doesn't have an answer to why men and women give up their lives to rescue someone they've never seen before. Right. See what manner of love the Father has shown to us. See it with your own eyes. See the big picture of who God is. So that we could be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. The reason why a young person sitting here is bored with what I'm saying is because their eyes are blinded by the God of this world. They are enslaved to the elementary principle of this world. And they are spiritually dead. That's why they need to be quickened. That's why they need to be born again. Beloved, we are God's children now. Right now we're God's children. Right now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, when Jesus comes back, when the perusia occurs, when the great return of Jesus Christ comes back, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Do you long to see Jesus? Do you ever think about, I can't wait to see you, God? Do you ever lay in your bed and think, I can't wait to see God? I can't wait to see him face to face. Is there anything inside of you that says, I want to see God? I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't have a longing to see God, you need to find out what's going on inside of you. You might still be enslaved to the elementary principles of this world. Because when God frees us from that slavery, we have a heart that wants God. We have a heart that wants to see him like an adopted person who finds out 50 years later that they had a dad and that he's still alive. You know what you want to do? You want to meet your father. And when God sends his spirit inside us, the spirit bears witness with our spirit and we cry out, Abba, Father. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning, wait a minute, verse 3, and everyone who thus hopes in Jesus, in him, purifies him or herself as he is pure. Everyone, verse 4, who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is a lawlessness, it's a transgression of God's law. You know that he appeared in order to take away sin. In him there is no sin. No one, look at this text, no one who abides in Jesus keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. I don't know if I even agree with you, Pastor. I'm not even sure there's a devil. Really? Why don't you explain to me why a little child who from the moment they are born, you nurture them, you feed them, you clothe them, you bathe them, They nurse at your very breast. And at two years old, they become the devil impersonated them very selves. 
Anyone who has had a two-year-old knows exactly what I'm talking about. How in the world are they acting so rude? How could they be so rebellious? What do you, go out, take care of yourself. Get out the house and don't come back. <laughs> they know they can't make it on their own. They know there's no hope that they could survive a day in the wilderness by themselves. And yet they're talking to you like they're the sovereign and you need to submit to their authority. Right. How did that happen? How did they go from being so loving at birth to a snot at three years old? <laughs> Ask yourself that question. If they're concerned about their own survival, as we're told, survival of the fittest, their best interest is to keep you in check. I mean, in their loving grace. They have no hope of surviving on their own. There is a devil out there. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, but God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. Verse 10, and we're done. By this it is evident, by this it is obvious, by this the whole world can see who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Don't you believe one minute this lie that everyone's a child of God? The truth is you're a child of the devil until God's adopted you into his family. Amen. That's the truth. I've used this illustration, I'll use it again. Next week, on those doors, children of God, children of the devil. Let's see how many go through the children of the devil doors. Children of God use these doors. Children of the devil lose the doors next week. I hope I remember to put that up, Chuck. That would be awesome. You go out there. Man, everybody's flanking to the right side, man. It's a line right along here. Those doors, no one's going through there. Who's going to say I'm a child of the devil? Nobody. You know what we want? We want the middle ground. Don't call me a child of the devil, but I'm not ready to be a child of God. We want the middle ground. Here's the reality. It's by. And you don't get to pick your own. You don't get to self-identify any way you want from one day to the next. Choose to follow Jesus and become a child of God. Choose to believe the truth and become a child of God. Father God in heaven, bless the effort to communicate gospel truth to a auditorium, to a people group, who some of which are enslaved to the elementary principle of this world. In Jesus' name, amen.